what an extraordinary place we're in at the moment. Um, computers are just absolutely everywhere. It might seem obvious, but unless you're deliberately looking, uh, it's rather like the iceberg where you've only got a tenth of it showing above the water and, and there's nine tenths going on where you can't actually see it. Uh, for instance, a modern car might have up to 50 microprocessors in it these days. Uh, I've only just found in researching for this that uh, there are some cars going around which have 3,000 semiconductor chips. It, it's quite obvious that the car of the future isn't like the car of the past. Uh, it, it's now a mobile computer. It wasn't always like this. When I was young, uh, the question of how many computers are in a car would have been ludicrous. Uh, in fact, the question might have made more sense if it was reversed. The first computer I worked on took up so much space in its own large computing hall that it could have been turned into a car park for a dozen cars. Um, and by any measure whatsoever, this has been an extraordinarily rapid change in the way that products are designed and delivered to us. And it's the characteristics of the semiconductor industry which allowed this to happen. There is a law called Moore's Law, which has summarized much of what's going on for the last 50 years. It's not a law at all, but it was proposed by Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel. And it was an observation and a short-term prediction made in 1965 based on only five data points gathered since 1959. And taking that, he predicted a doubling in chip density every year for the next 10 years. 10 years later, in 1975, he revised this to a doubling every two years or so. And, and so, in fact, it has remained more or less up to the present day. And now we can squeeze, well, last year, Apple put 57 billion transistors onto a single chip. I can hardly believe I'm saying these words myself because it is so shocking, so amazing. So on a single chip, Apple M1 Max has a CPU with 10 64-bit processor cores, a graphics processing unit with 32 cores, a 16-core neural engine. Uh, the memory bandwidth is equally staggering. 400 gigabytes per second can be pushed onto this chip and pulled off. And all of this is not to drive some the International Space Station. This is for a portable notebook computer powered by a smallish battery. The world has never seen this scale of sustained exponential growth before, neither following the invention of the printing press, which definitely changed the world. Similarly, in the Industrial Revolution changed the entire world forever. But it wasn't at this pace. Even that was not at this pace. And even if Moore's law was invalidated today and, and forever, I think we've still got several decades of hard work to deal with the legacy of the growth that we've already lived through in the past 50 years. And I think perhaps the most important of these issues to deal with is educating our young people to master the world which we and, and Moore's Law has bequeathed to them. Training people for life and for a, not a career because nobody's going to have a single career. We need to train people for an unpredictable world which we know will change and in ways that we can't predict. We need to remove people's ideas that they are this thing or that thing or that there are boundaries they must not cross. Even though all the kids are clearly not going to end up being programmers themselves, they will be in a world in which programming controls an increasing percentage of what they experience or what they interact with. So it can only be useful to have some understanding of what that process is, of what programs are and what they can do. Um, so I think it's important for everybody to learn it, even though they're not all going to be programmers. Kids are learning machines of a very high order. Let them go as fast as they possibly can. They will be facing problems of a wholly different order than, than, than I have faced. Um, and, and we can't tell what most of them are going to be. So we've got to concentrate on teaching them to learn, to extract from their 
actual experience to propose experiments to stretch themselves to understand new problems that, that there might arise. How young you can start kids doing things. There isn't an age at which it's too young to start. The key is to foster in our future citizens the ability to comprehend problems, to model them, either in their heads or with mathematics or in programs, and thus gain mastery over the intellectual and physical tools that they will need to, to use to solve the problems of the future. And we all start long before school in, in doing some of this anyway. Uh, we all start as soon as in the cradle to observe and model the world we find ourselves in and start to assert mastery over the physical world, playing with blocks, toys, learning that some things are hard, some things are soft, some things break, some things flow. And we learn largely by doing. I'd like to refer to Richard Feynman, famous Nobel Prize winner uh, and uh, author of a phenomenally successful book uh, called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Finally, I said I couldn't see how anyone could be educated by this self-propagating system in which people pass exams and teach others to pass exams, but nobody knows anything. And that's because this scenario results in training people to answer questions that have already been formulated, not to understand things such that they can answer questions that have not even been thought of yet. Give kids the opportunity, the starting point, the materials and support to do stuff and they will just take off like a rocket.